Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, June 23rd, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. The DA today has a nice introduction to WinMerge, and well, for a change, no, it's not a Python script. It's actually GUI software that runs on Windows and allows you to easily compare to Office documents. Well, you may say Word has a feature where I can compare two documents and look at what was edited. That's not what WinMerge is about. It actually compares the internal XML structure of the documents, metadata and the like. So a lot more thorough than just uh, comparing like what the text may have changed between two documents. Where it is may come in handy, for example, is quite often we see with spear phishing attacks where an attacker uses an existing document that someone has published, for example, on their website and then adds some malicious payload to it. Of course, uh, with WinMerge, if you do have that original document available, it may be really easy to then pull out what is the malicious component that the attacker added. On Patch Tuesday two weeks ago, I was a little bit surprised that my Mac never prompted me for any of the Microsoft Office updates. And I didn't really pay too much attention, I have to admit, but it turns out that Microsoft was a little bit late in actually releasing the updates for Microsoft Office on the Mac. They now, and actually last week they did that, uh, but still delayed, have released updates for four vulnerabilities in Microsoft Office for the Mac. Three of these vulnerabilities can actually lead to remote code execution. So definitely make sure you apply them. Also, while we're talking about the Mac, VMware also has released an update for VMware tools for Mac OS. Now, VMware tools is what you're running inside the guest. So this vulnerability only affects you if you're running Mac OS inside a guest. This is not a problem as long as you run VMware Fusion on a Mac and have other operating systems as guest systems. And in the past, I have uh, reported a few times about vulnerabilities in anti-malware software. And there have been many vulnerabilities in pretty much all the big products in the past. But uh, often we don't really hear a lot of details how they can be exploited. This is different for Bitdefender, where Vladimir Poland has written a blog with some proof of concept code showing how a vulnerability that he has reported to Bitdefender can be exploited. Now, first of all, the vulnerability has been patched about a month ago, and Vladimir says that Bitdefender was actually exemplary in the way they have dealt with this vulnerability and interacted with him. But exploitation of the vulnerability is actually rather trivial and can be accomplished by just injecting JavaScript into a web page that the victim is visiting. The problem here is how Bitdefender deals with uh, HTTPS and with errors that occur if you're browsing an HTTPS website. Most anti-malware does intercept HTTPS and of course filters uh, the content, filters URLs for exploits. And if a page is not found, it may either just send the 404 error back to the browser, let the browser display the error, or as Bitdefender, it injects its own error message telling the user that the page got blocked for security reasons or that the page was not available. And that's exactly where the problem happened here by exploiting a vulnerability in how these error pages are being displayed displayed, it's pretty trivial to actually inject arbitrary code and execute code on the user's system. With exploitation being so easy, I hope that you updated Bitdefender and again, the patch was released in May. 
The next story really has sort of two components. One is Google Analytics, and the second component is content security policy. So content security policy has become popular over the last few years, and it allows you to define exactly what kind of content your web page is supposed to display. And to do so, you inject a content security policy header defining these rules. Well, uh, the rules uh, can be quite fine grained content security policy is quite good about this but of course if you make them too fine grained then you may block some valid content and one example here is google analytics so with content security policy you can limit who is allowed to actually include javascript in your page and of course most pages use google analytics so they whitelist www.google-analytics.com Problem with that, well, uh, there are a lot of users of Google Analytics, so a malicious user could actually inject Google Analytics scripts into your page and then add additional parameters and in doing so exfiltrate data. So kind of what Magecart and the like are doing, that's now possible through Google Analytics without ever including a content from any third party that may be blocked by your content security policy. At this point, there is no real sort of clear solution for this problem other than don't allow others to inject JavaScript into your site. Theoretically, of course, if Google Analytics would, for example, add a user ID to the host name or such, that may help to allow you to write more fine-grained CSPs. Well, and that's it for today. Don't forget at 1 p.m. today Eastern, we do have our Tech Tuesday workshop where I'll go over how to use the Internet Storm Center data and how to set up a honeypot. The link to the session is at the top of the homepage of the Internet Storm Center website. That's it. Thanks for listening. Talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.